chapter uh, number four as we navigate Paul's letter to Timothy. And he's saying to Timothy, Timothy, be loyal to the truth and true teaching of the word of God. Now, the fact of the matter is this narrative this morning uh, reads like the morning newspaper because the fact of the matter is we're, uh, we're all touched by it. Uh, I want you to stand with me and let's begin reading in the first verse. 1 Timothy chapter number 4 beginning in verse 1. Now, the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats, which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. For it is sanctified by the word of God and prayer. If thou put the brethren to remembrance of these things, thou shalt be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto thou hast attained. Would you join me as we pray together? Father, we uh, really humble ourselves before you this morning, realizing, knowing that God, we can do nothing without you. We acknowledge that. But we also acknowledge that we can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. Get glory in the proclamation of your word today. Not for fame or fortune by the deliverer, but to the end that someone might believe and in believing, they might have everlasting life. I pray this in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Thank you. Please uh, be seated, please. Now, you're going to discover this morning in this six-verse narrative that there is an incredible flow to Paul's admonition to Timothy. Uh, It's like from one mountaintop to another, if you will. And uh, I want to be able to take you there for a few minutes. Paul is making a huge plea. Here to Timothy, he's saying, for God's sake, Timothy, guard the truth. In the name of Jesus, uphold the truth. Uh, Hold it in high esteem, high regard. Proclaim it, because if you don't, heresy is going to creep in. And it will be allowed inside the church. And if it gets inside the church, it will have a devastating effect. So Timothy, as a young pastor, guard the truth. Hold on to it. So let's look for a minute at this flow as he's giving it to Timothy. The first thing I want you to see with me this morning is the times, the times that he is speaking of. Verse number one, he says, now the spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time, Some shall depart from the faith. Now, what does he mean here, latter times? What is is he trying to communicate to Timothy? Well, he's clearly saying something to us as well. And this is not some kind of new revelation that Paul has suddenly come with. He's going back in history and he is remembering the words of the Lord Jesus And he's communicating to Timothy, Timothy, we're living in these latter times. So let's remember what Jesus said. Turn back with me, if you hold your spot there, and uh, go back with me to uh, Matthew, if you will, in the 24th chapter. Matthew chapter 24. Notice verse number four. Matthew 24, four. Jesus answered and said unto them, Take heed that no man deceive you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. Look at verse 11. And many false prophets shall rise, and shall deceive many. 
Notice in verse 24 of that uh, same chapter, if you will. Uh, now there shall arise false Christs and false prophets and shall show great signs and wonders insomuch that if it were possible, they shall deceive the very elect. Mark gives us the same account of that in the 13th chapter, saying basically the very same thing that uh, Matthew is recording as the words of Jesus. In uh, Second Peter, Peter is writing that in the latter days, scoffers will arise and they will bring with them deception and heresy that will enter in wholesale and have a serious effect, he says, uh, within the body of Christ. Now, in our text this morning, back in 1 Timothy, he uses the term uh, latter days. Now, what is he referring to here as latter days? Uh, it's also referred to in uh, the Gospels as the last day. It means an, an epic time in history, a particular era, if you will, that began at Pentecost when the Spirit of God descended and the church was born between that uh, origination of the church and the time that Jesus will return and set up his earthly reign here on this earth. That is the description of latter days or last days. Now, you and I are living in the last of the last days. Uh, the Bible describes it as end times. But the word of God predicts that before that happens, heresy, deception is going to creep inside the church and there is going to be a falling away of the truth. He goes on to describe it as this, that there will be people inside the body of Christ that will have itching ears that will want to surround themselves with leaders that will tell them what they want to hear rather than what thus saith the word of God. Tell us what we like to hear, things that are to our liking not necessarily what may match up uh, to what God's word says. And the Bible says that they will be led away into myths, if you will. And when Paul left uh, the church at Ephesus, he says to the church, now church, you be careful because grievous wolves are going to enter in and they will devour the flock and they will not spare the flock. Ladies and gentlemen, um, it is my great displeasure to tell you that you and I are living in one of those times right now. Uh, I am seeing the greatest move of confusion moving across evangelicalism today that the world has never seen, nor will it ever see again. And the only way that we're going to abate this is that we must go deeper and deeper and more and more into the word of God and knowing the truth of the word of God, what we believe and why we believe it and in whom we believe. More now than ever before. So we see the times. Second, I want you to see the turning. Notice again in verse number one, that in the latter times, some shall depart from the faith. Now, who are these people? You say, Pastor, just a few weeks ago that uh, you preached a message that describes once you get in, you're never going to get out. But now then all of a sudden things change and switch up a little bit and you say they're going to depart from the faith. They're going to leave the faith. Well, if you get over into the second chapter of the first epistle of first John, then you discover the word of God says that they went out from us because they were not of us. For had they been of us, they would have not gone out from us. In, in, in other words, it's like Mark 13 and the, power, uh, the parable of the sower when some of the seed that was sown 
fell on the highway out there and the birds came and snatched up that seed before that seed ever had a time and an opportunity to germinate. Paul is saying that these people that are departing from the faith, they went through all the right motions. They said all of the right things. They were, here's what I like to say, (laughs) Uh, they were starched and ironed, but they were never washed. May have even been baptized and joined the church. Gone through all of the outward trappings, but inwardly knew not Christ. May, May I help folks today? You know, going to church and getting baptized and signing some card of membership doesn't make you a Christian. Any more than going to McDonald's makes you a Big Mac. It just doesn't work that way. You understand Paul is saying that uh, when the pressure mounts, when things get tough, they're going to bail out. In essence, the reason they're going to bail out is that they never experienced life change. May I just say, it's people that everybody may think that because they live a certain way and act a certain way and look a certain way, they have fooled others into believing, yeah, I've got the real deal, but they've never inwardly been changed by the power of God. If you've never experienced a life change, then you don't have the real thing. Matter of fact, there's going to be a lot of people who thought they were going to make it themselves. Oh, Lord, didn't we prophesy in your name? Lord, in your name, we we cast out devils. And in your name, we did a lot of wonderful things. And God's going to say, depart from me. I never knew you. Now, let me look at the teachers. We've looked at the times and the turning. Look with me a few minutes at the teachers. Latter part of verse 1 giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies in hypocrisy, having their own conscience seared with a hot iron. Listen, listen, perk up, pay attention now. He's simply saying deception, false teaching, heresy. All of that has their source. You don't want to think about this. You don't want to acknowledge this. Nobody really uh, wants to come to grips with this. False teaching, heresy, all of that, deception, has its source in demonology. That's what Paul is referring to here. Straight out of the pit of hell, self-orchestrated by the devil and his imps. You, You understand, Satan's too smart to go down the street and put up a building and establish a university and staff it with a bunch of demons dressed in red suits and horns trying to teach and propagate this false gospel. He's too smart for that. So what does he do? He takes that message and he plants it, if you will, these teachings. uh, He actually incarnates it into the lives of people that look just like you and look like me. They wear suits and they wear dresses and they look just like us. And they go and they get jobs as instructors and teachers and professors in our accredited institutions. And some of your kids and grandkids right now are sitting at the feet of the very ones that Satan has deposited this kind of heresy. What are you talking about, Pastor? I'm saying that our kids are swallowing hook, line, and sinker. The doctrine of humanism, the doctrine of syncretism, the doctrine of docetism, and 25 other kinds of isms that are out there. All in the name of academia. Hmm. May I give you a good opinion here? I think it's pretty good. 
You know, the hope of America is really lying in the minds and the hearts and the lives of the 18 to 25 year olds in this country. And if we're going to have a hope in this nation of this next generation, that generation is going to have to come to terms with the gospel. They've got to know whom they believe and what they believe and why they believe it. Here's a frightening thought. It used to be that secular, human secularism and human, humanism and uh, syncretism all found their ways and their places uh, in the secular educational system of our day. But I'm just going to tell you, you, you need to really be aware that it also has crept into the religious institutions of our land and the Christian centers of higher education. The Bible says that Satan uses hypocritical liars. Did you see that term? And people whose conscience has been seared. Now, Alvin, who's on the platform a few minutes ago, he's from uh, Texarkana, Texas. You ever been to Texas and seen all the big cattle ranches and things that are out there? They're everywhere out there. Now, what they do is they, they take their cattle and they will brand those cattle. Now, why did they do that? Because it has a sign of ownership. It, it shows who those cattle's, uh, cattle belongs to. Now, here's what's happening right here. These seared consciences that are here. May, may, I, may I just simply put it this way? It's someone that's teaching the Bible that the Bible is less than the inspired, infallible, authoritative word of God is a person that has been branded by Satan and his demons and fully possessed and belongs in the system of demonology. Let's move on to the teaching itself. We, we've looked at the teachers. What, what's, what's Paul talking here about the teaching? Uh, look at verse 3. Forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. Now Paul is referring to these philosophers who have crept into the church. By the way, they have a name. Uh, they were called the Gnostics. G-N-O-S-T-I-C-S. Now, what did the Gnostics believe? The Gnostics believe that all matter is evil. The body is matter. Therefore, the body uh, must be evil. It must be deprived of its desires. Therefore, we must not give in to the sexual desires because the sexual desires lead to marriage. Therefore, if you're really going to be a Christian, then you cannot marry. Now, that was the Gnostics' belief. Now, there are certain religious groups out there that remain today that say if you're going to be clergy in our organization, then you cannot get married. You must remain single. The second thing he's referring to here is that there are certain kinds of food. There's a list of foods that you are not allowed to eat. Now, my doctor must have got a hold of that. <laughs> because he just says that anything that tastes good, you can't eat it. So he's saying here, if, you, if you're really a Christian, you cannot marry or eat anything that's decent and that fostered a hermit style of living that was invading the church in Paul's day. I heard about a guy who wanted to become a monk and so he goes and joins the St. Benedict Monastery and they take him and they said, okay, if you want to be a monk, then you, you go over here and for these next 10 years, 
Uh, you're going to live this isolated hermit style life. And after 10 years, we'll bring you out and we will allow you to say two words. Nothing more than that, just the two words. And every 10 years, we'll bring you out and you'll say two words and two words only. So he did that. He went in and got in that isolated room and stayed in there for 10 years. They brought him out and they said, now be very careful what you say. You can only say two words and, 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 and be cautious and choose your words carefully. And so he said, uh, food bad. <laughs> they put him back in for 10 more years. He comes back out. Be careful about your words. You only get two. Bed hard. Went back in for 10 more years, came back out and said, well, what's your two words now? And he said, I quit. <laughs> they looked back at him and said, well, you may as well quit. You hadn't done anything but complain ever since you've been here. <laughs> hmm. then, then we have a different kind of creeping into the church today from the Gnostics. We, we've got the health, wealth, and prosperity extremists uh, that are with us. And then we've got the gospel of freedom that says now that you are saved, you can just live any way that you want to kind of doctrine. As it relates to marriage, let me just say to you this morning, God created marriage. He instituted marriage long before the church Long before education, he created marriage. He stood back and he said, this is good. And I want to go on record this morning as saying God is right. Can I get a witness from the men in the church? Men, marriage is good. And, 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 and ladies, marriage is good. Wow. Wow. Four women. <laughs> mm. And yet, Paul, Paul is saying that there's some foods out there that you can't eat, but Jesus said, declared all foods to be clean. And those two major issues that they were facing. Let me help 21st century church for a minute. And let me give you some tools that you can use to help you guard your mind and your heart against the false teachings that are permeating the landscape of evangelicalism today. Are you ready? Just some questions that you need to ask. When you are encountering something and you're thinking, wait a minute, is that true? All right, here we go. Question one. You ask yourself, does it glorify and exalt the Lord Jesus? The second question is, does it complement his bride, the church, or does it put the church down? The third question you need to be asking is, what I am hearing and being taught, does it have a high view of scripture? Number four, does it document its teaching with scripture exclusively or does it rely on something else to help prop it up from quotes of some other writer such as the word of God says and Joseph Smith also says. The Bible says but Mary Baker Eddy says. So what you're hearing uh, it can, does, is it scripture exclusively or does it be propped up by something else? Number five, does it acknowledge believers in other Christian churches? Here, be very careful because here's where the cults, you can kind of identify when they say, you know what? We're the only ones that believe this. And if you're really going to go to heaven, if you really want to know God, you've got to become one of us. You can't be something else. Number six, is its main mission to evangelize the lost or 
is the proponents of what you are being led to believe playing on and praying on the minds of weaker Christians to alter them? Are we after to win the lost or are we after the Christians who are weak? Uh, number seven, does it advocate a holy lifestyle? God help us, folks. I, I could stop right there and stay a while. Number eight, does it teach salvation by grace alone or is it salvation plus some kind of work? Just keep those in mind. So we've looked at time, we've looked at turning, we've looked at teaching and we've looked at teachers. Let's look a minute at the truth. Number five, if you will, at verse 3, forbidding to marry and commanding to abstain from meats which God hath created to be received with thanksgiving of them which believe and know the truth. For every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. So let's apply this truth for a minute uh, to marriage within the context of this scripture and also with food. If you go, now I was just wondering, God, what, what about uh, what you said? And so you go back to Genesis chapter nine and verse number three, the Bible says, every moving thing that liveth shall be meat for you. Even as the green herb, I have given you all things. You say, now wait a minute, pastor, because later on, there were some restrictions that were given and uh, it applied to uh, the Jewish community. That's absolutely right. Uh, no question, you won't get any argument out of me, but that was just temporary. Thank God we don't live under the law anymore. We've been delivered from the law, died to the law. Verse four, for every creature of God is good and nothing to be refused if it be received with thanksgiving. Hey, wouldn't that be, when you read verse four, wouldn't that be a great verse of scripture to read uh, or to pray over every meal that you have? Just be thinking, God, this is great stuff. And God, I receive this from you. And I'm so thankful for this. That would be great. Now, you know, if you eat one time a day, then you could pray that one time a day. If you eat twice a day, then pray it two times a day, right over your meal. Frank, he, Frank Carter up there, he sinned against God and brought me one of those 15 layer chocolate cakes last night and dropped it off at my house. But I want you to know, I sat there and I said, oh Jesus, thank you for this wonderful, <laughs> wonderful. If you eat three times a day, then wouldn't it be wonderful just to uh, pray this scripture over all... If you eat without ceasing, then pray without ceasing. You, don't, you understand what I'm saying here? I, I've sat before some, some spreads and I've had to pray. Dear God, protect me from this food. I've had to. You see, the truth is Christ died for our sins. Now, what's the task? Verse 6. If thou put the brethren in remembrance of these things, you'll be a good minister of Jesus Christ, nourished up in the words of faith and of good doctrine, whereunto you have attained. Remember the truths of the faith. Remember the truths of the faith. Remember the truths of the faith. Timothy, preach Christ and the authority of God's word. He's about 19 years old inexperienced, no big degrees hanging in the wall by his name, a novice in the work of God. Paul says, Timothy, just preach the Bible. You know, down through the years, I've watched this ebb and flow in the pulpits that has swept across this country. And... Um, Occasionally, periodically, uh, in, in some of, more of my more insecure times in my life, I, I've been tempted to say, you know what, God, um, 
Maybe I need to be like so-and-so and preach more like they preach. They draw great big crowds. They see lots of people show up. They fill up the building. Maybe I, I need to preach more like them. And the Holy Ghost, without fail, every time in those insecure moments, the Holy Spirit of God keeps saying, just preach the Bible and I'll take care of the word meeting the needs of the people. You just be faithful to preach the Bible. And I want to say to you this morning, as long as God gives me the opportunity, as long as God gives me breath, as long as God gives me strength, and as long as he lets me pastor First Baptist Church Indian Trail, I don't, I don't care what everybody else is preaching. I'm going to stick as close as I can to the old, old gospel because it is the gospel of Jesus that is going to change the lives of people. Now, the truth is this. In the beginning, God created man. And he breathed into man the breath of life. And the Bible says that he became a living soul. And man and God had a wonderful union. They had a wonderful relationship. Until man allowed sin to come into his life. When man allowed that sin to come into his life, then that oneness with God was severed. And sin separated man from God. God in his love, God in his mercy, came to the rescue of man and he established one bridge after another so that man could receive forgiveness and have a relationship with God until that time that God's only begotten son. For he so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Jesus came, wrapped himself up in human flesh, lived among us without sin, and that sinless, spotless, sacrificial lamb hung upon an old rugged cross and shed his rich, red, royal, innocent blood. And it was that blood that he shed on the cross that paid your sin debt and my sin debt and the sin debt of all of the world. And that cross became the bridge between lost humanity and God. You may be here this morning and your life may be broken. It may be maimed. It may be scarred. I want to say to you today that God built a bridge so that you could be forgiven, so that you could be clean, so that that state that man had with God in the beginning could be fully restored and that you could know him and the power of his resurrection and have the assurance that when you die you'll go to heaven if you'll just come to him no matter your sordid past no matter the depth of your sin no matter how far away from God you have gone, God built a bridge and he beckons you to come to him. Would you bow with me as we pray together? Every head bowed, every eye closed for just a moment. Sir, ma'am, if you're here this morning, and you've never fully trusted Jesus Christ as your Lord and as your Savior. If your life is a mess, if your life is 
steeped in sin and degradation. If, you, if your life is so far away from God that the enemy is saying to you, oh, you could never get to God. He could never forgive you. Well, you're the one that he died for. You're the one that he loves. You're the one that he wants to forgive. You're the one that he wants to bring to himself. Right where you're seated, would you just cry out to God? Would you just tell God, God, I'm one of those people that's been separated from you. Just tell him, God, I can't do anything about my sin. Thank you for dying on that cross for me. Thank you for shedding your blood so that my sins could be forgiven. God, please forgive me of all my sin. Today, right now, I willingly turn away from sin. And God, with your help, I'll live for you the rest of my life. Thank you for hearing me pray. Thank you for forgiving my sin. Thank you for coming into my heart. Thank you for saving me.